what's it like being home educated? Fun, fun. In home school, you can play and play and play. And you can do whatever you like. And play and play and play. And you can also put Marmite on your head if you really want to. Yeah. I love this is what we will do together. Education is what all human societies do um, all the time with the young and with the not so young. Education is inducting young people into the society and that means um, introducing them to the culture, the language, the ways of being. Um, and in my view, a, a, a great education is an education that invites people not only into the world as it is, but invites them to wonder about the world as it could be, and gives them some of the tools or gives them access to the tools to not only question everything before them, but to take it into their own hands and transform it. One of the mistakes we make is we conflate learning with formal learning, or we conflate learning with teaching. Children are learning all the time. You can't be a living being without learning. Now what you're learning may not be what anybody prescribes for you to learn. It may not be what anybody wants you to learn. But you cannot be alive without learning. Some of what you learn is negative and destructive. You learn boredom. You learn obedience. You learn um, you know, negative social behaviors. You learn a lot. But the point is you're always learning. Whether you want to call it play or, you know, extended investigation or active learning, whatever, you've got to smell it, touch it, see it, taste it, hear it in order to learn it. And there's got to be some emotional engagement as well and stimuli. You've got to want to do it. It's got to make you happy or... I don't know, challenged or something. And then you've got to feel the success or perhaps even the frustration and then the determination to carry on trying it in order for those connections to wire up in, in the brain. And it's so linked to new neuroscience. Um, fairly robust, but still new. About 25 years, really, of studying the brain when it's actually ticking and learning. Um, scientists have had the capacity to now tell us, actually, we don't learn in a lesson. We don't learn something in 20 minutes or in a silo. Oh, here's something about maths and you'll learn it four ways. It needs to be practical and cross-curricular. It's got to have some type of relevance to, what, to, to me, to my world, to what I'm doing in order for me to mentally engage with it and then learn it. So building a rocket ship and over a two-week period out of boxes and fabrics and whatever, wires and planks, is going to teach a five-year-old or a seven-year-old so much more about maths and science than a, a lesson would. But facilitating that as a teacher of a class of 35 is, is no easy task. But it can be done. It's winter, guys! We better get in our cozy house!
and where you've got the pressure to make every child attain at said level, you feel, well, the best way I can do it is to get every kid through my little 20 minute lesson and I can at least know that I've ticked this box that they've learned it. But the dichotomy is you get to the end of the year, they all go on summer break and they come back and the next year teacher says, oh, you said they know all these things. No, they don't. Yeah, because they had them in their working memory for 10 minutes while they needed to and in order to achieve a test, but then it goes because it doesn't settle into your long-term memory because there was no need for it. There's no interest for it. It's not actually learnt. It's just, oh, I have to go and please my teacher for a minute and make sure I know enough to get it done. And then off it goes. It's gone again. And if you don't use it every day, or if there's no need to use it, or want, and for a young child, if there's no want to use it, they'll go. And in fact, if it's painful at the time of doing it, they'll block it out. And in fact, tell themselves, oh, I'm not very good at maths. When actually every brain is good at maths, because it's 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 day to day, it's our world, it's it's how we live in mathematics. It's it's a an in-depth feature of our planet. So every brain understands maths, but you just understand it in a different way. And only the people who learn it the way that the curriculum syllabus is written, the ones who wrote it, have brains that way. So I learn it through mathematic figures and lines and numbers and funny, weird, wiggle shapes, whereas someone else learns it through mud pies and, <laughs> you know, creating something wonderful as a structure or building a building or Oh, he's an architect. Well, that's mathematics everywhere. But when he's five or six and he's building in the Lego area, oh yes, he does a lot of that, but he, he doesn't really shine with his maths. Hmm, let's marry that up actually. Shape and space and dimension and oh, we can add in there. If you're a skilled teacher, you'll then say, let's count out or add up how many or let's see how many more we might need. Oh, I wonder what five times five would be. Look at that, you know, and you can go the journey. But it's something they're interested in, therefore they'll remember it. Autonomous education is what we all do all the time. What we're doing now, we're having a conversation, you're asking me questions, you're interested to know the answer, I'm telling you a bit about it, and if you don't understand what I say, you'll ask me another question, and we'll have a dialogue going back and forth, and eventually, we'll both have learned something. And that's fundamentally what autonomous education is. And you're constantly watching other people, you're listening to them, you're hearing the words they use, you know, everybody is hot-wired to learn. It's part of the human condition. And at that aspect, everybody is a scientist. Because the basic way that children learn things, you look for a pattern, then you look for exceptions to the pattern, then you get a more sophisticated model of what the pattern is. That's fundamentally the whole of science. And yet it's what every single human being does. And so we all learn. We can all learn for ourselves. Do you want to go to school? No. Why not? Because it's so boring. How do you know you've not been there? I have. No. Wilfie stand. Wilfie stand. You have to do drawing. Oh. And I don't like doing this drawing. Have to listen to the teacher, or you, or you, 
or they'll say, get out of here. Really? Yeah. Oh, is that what happens to Wilty? Yeah. Wow. But he does, he runs away to jump over the, the, the stools. Does he? Runs away, jump over seven houses <gasps> to get to the, his house. Wow. To say that we home educate is just a very small part of it because every parent home educates. Every parent makes the decision about whether they're going to pay extra to go to piano lessons. Every parent is going to worry about what they can do to help their child go forward in the world and hopefully at the end of it leave home with a job. <laughs> Most people who bring up concerns about home education will bring up concerns about well, how are they going to get their GCSEs or how are they going to get their A-levels, which isn't actually an educational question, it's a question of how do you get um, a qualification. Um, and I don't think not going to school means you, can, you can't get qualifications. There's a, something that you do when you're getting a qualification and ed every adult learner in the world recognises this. You work out what you need to get the qualification and you focus on having those things and then you get the qualification and it becomes like a, um, a really instrumental process but that's a very different process from genuinely engaging in something because you love it and um, or engaging with something because you're curious about it or just having sort of background awareness of how the world works um, and it, I think probably there's too much emphasis at the moment in schools on qualification getting including passing SATs or whatever it is, and not enough focus on cultivating a disposition towards the world that it is full of delight and that you can, you know, that whatever you learn about, there'll always be, there'll always be something more to discover about what you're looking at. I mean, I'm sure Kafka says, you know, stand in, you know, if you sit and stare, a grain of sand, like the whole universe will come and dance in front of you. And, and there's something about that deep engagement in something that I think um, it must be very hard to achieve in a school setting. states it in the curriculum, this curriculum is to support children to have the skills they need for life, but yet Ofsted comes in and tests them against their attainment targets or their achievement. And they do say we're looking at the progress for each child, but we're still going to look at how you score against national and local averages. So head teachers are in a bind, really. And most of the ones I speak to want the best for those kids, but they're hands are tied as well, with all that's coming down from them, from the DfE or from Ofsted, 
and, and they feel restricted because they want to do the things that we talk about and open up your way of teaching and open up the mindsets of teachers and free them to just play and engage and talk and invent and create and explore with young children in order to help them to learn things that will be lifelong. Well, we want that, but we have attainment targets to meet. So we've got to sit them down at a table with a piece of paper. Folly. There's a broad consensus that the 1988 Education Reform Act was really the point at which the market came to town as far as education was concerned. It didn't happen immediately. If you ask most teachers what they know about the Act, it was the fact that the National Curriculum was introduced. But there were other measures in the Act, and the most important one, and you'll see it was the door opener, was the removal of control from local authorities to schools themselves that became their own financial self-governing entities. The moment that happened, whether, and most of us didn't, but whether you liked it or not, what you had was schools acting as small self-governing companies. When you have a mini business, you have to demonstrate that you're successful, uh, particularly if your funding depends upon it. And the only way that education has ever successfully measured itself since 1988 is through test results, is through exam results. And what that then means in real terms is that you have a regime of coaching, rehearsal, of grade targeting, that again permeates everything that happens. And that is because of an ideological commitment to the market, to competition, to um, financial uh, self-sufficiency. So it, it, it bleeds in to everything that happens. Whatever budget it is they give to school children, you're not given that to educate your child. And to a degree, um, there's a part of me that likes that because the second that you take that money, you take some conditions. And that's what schooling is. It's a series of conditions that I actually disagree with in an educational process. So, I, you know, I'm quite happy. But I do... But it is... <laughs> it's quite. I mean, it's really hard in a society where we've we've got ourselves into this situation where you really do need two working adults to provide a more than basic living, um, and so that's quite difficult. Um, Childcare is really, really expensive, and yeah, it's, you don't get masses of support. And I actually think our financial circumstances we're not well off and we sort of struggle to make ends meet. And I think that immediately makes you look suspicious to people. Like, you know, I think of other friends who, whose partner, where it's really sort of the setup is one partner works and one partner is the person in majority in, in charge of their children and they have a more sort of stable financial basis. I, I feel like they are more likely to get a a good hearing than a family who are, you know, they're not like our circumstances are, we do get child tax credits. So I feel like that immediately is a tick against you. Um, because that's the world that we live in, that we, we live in a, we, at the moment the public discourse is that people who accept any kind of benefit are in some way feckless and are in some way um, not trustworthy and 
too chaotic to be entrusted with their children. So, you know, it's hard. Like on the one hand, I really do like the idea of people being concerned about my children, but on the other hand, I know that that concern will not be about particularly about is that child okay? How can we support that child? But will instead be crystallised in suspicions about my competency, which is a different thing from concern about my child. Hello. <laughs> That should be an educational thing, like how do you earn a living when you come out of school? How do you prepare yourself when you come out of school to the big wide world? They don't do that, they just limit you with all these subjects, assess you and expect you to become successful from them. It's not really a successful system. Yeah, well, it's a very narrow definition of success, it is um, it's GCSE passes. Five A to C, isn't it? Um, that's the uh, that's the measure of, of success. I suppose it's to prove in reading, read and write. But I, I, I always think that it's the the curriculum is not what you're there to learn. You know, the structure of the institution is what you're being scored in. And it is about um, giving up your right to self determination and following instructions and precedent to that. We're in a post-industrial world now. The factory system needed those type of workers, middle management workers, high management, and the school. You know, it, it segregates those kinds of people. And by the time you come out of school, you know, I think you pretty well learn that to learn what I want is not nothing to do with me. I follow instructions. It seems to work pretty well. We've got a, an industrial <laughs> capitalist world of haves and have nots. We have this very clear notion that education is a commodity, that parents are clients, that I'm, I'm surprised actually that I haven't actually heard it used as rawly as that yet, that children are consumers and it goes straight back you know to the little vessels to have the facts poured into Dickens in hard times and we absolutely don't know how the people to, to the whole process. We're the sixth highest country in the world for children under the age of 10 years old who are clinically diagnosed with depression. Most of them are our socio-low, economic, working-class white boys. The engagement with our young boys in learning is one of our biggest challenges, especially from that particular group of children. A little boy won't always say what they know. Doesn't mean they don't know it. But they're not so good at holding pencils yet. They're not so good at sitting. And biology shows us that they're not ready to do that yet. Their muscles in their hands aren't actually fully formed to grip a pencil till six or seven. And it's kind of painful for them to do that. Or to sit up straight with their legs crossed. Their little back here isn't strong enough. Whereas girls develop differently and quicker in that way. So it's painful for them. So they want to roll on the floor or lay on their tummies. But you know, no, sit down, you're not achieving. Leave my class, go stand over there. Oh, I'm not very good at learning, you know, they'll say when actually they just learn in a different way. And we should value that and treasure that.
I remember my primary school, my reception teacher not liking me at all. And I always struggled to sit down and be quiet for six out of the seven hours that we were there, always. I was then disciplined with punishment playtimes, which is when during the playtime I would have to sit at a bench facing out onto the playtime, play playground. So I'd miss my playtime because I was overactive in class. Yeah, and so um, I think I, I also had at home a parent that didn't know anything different other than you must keep your child in school, children must be in school and because of that she was also quite confused because at home I was told I was great and creative and you know able and then at school I was told I was naughty and I was bad. Two words that were used constantly for me you know she heard children you know talking about me like that oh that's the naughty girl. I also think racism plays a part because the way racism plays out in this country is that or, and in uh, well in most countries is that brown people are put out as maybe slightly more aggressive, lower, not as intelligent. So all these things, you know, were there and the teachers were probably, the teachers aren't saints, you know, they come with their stuff. Mm. Then I was not able to conform. I was never, I, and what I think is really interesting when I look at my history is that I wanted to. I think it's sad, because as a really young person, I really wanted to conform. I wanted to be quiet, to forsake of not getting in trouble. I wanted to sit down, forsake of not getting in trouble. I wanted the teachers to like me. I wanted to be the best in the class, and I wasn't, you know, because only one person gets that, or two people, you know. And that's, that, that probably made me sad and a bit hopeless. And because I couldn't conform to what they needed and probably because there was a lot of expectation that I wouldn't because I was brown and working class, they put me on Ritalin. They diagnosed me with ADHD and then put me on Ritalin and my mum allowed that when I was eight. Yeah, and I was put on quite a high dose and it would get put up. My mum allowed it because she honestly didn't know that there was any other way apart from having a child in school and she had to work as a single parent and she, quote quoting her she said my spark was like pff, gone really obvious to me then in secondary school I ha and my teenage life and my early adult life has been battling drug addictions of course <laughs> to me it's like yeah all right you know given a drug told this makes you good full stop that's like the word that I plays in my mind now that I am bad and this you know I need things to be good or be okay so I spent yeah a lot of time taking lots of things you know just to conform. I think if you're with 30 or even 25 or even 20 children, it is utterly imperative that they are behaving. 
and I, can, I could not blame a teacher for needing to put strategies in which basically manipulate and basically, and also overstep the boundaries of what that child is cognitively ready for or, or emotionally ready for. I understand why they need to pu pursue that strategy, hence I don't want to put them, my child into that. So obsessed with classroom control, even from Diddy, you know, children at four sitting there like this on the carpet, and that's how they're, that's how they feel they'll be sort of res looked on as a good child. The quieter you are, the more, you know, I respect you. What, what message are we feeding them? And yet we have so up to up to 45 percent of our children coming into year one who haven't got speech language and communication skills needed to access the curriculum but yet in their early years we're always telling them to be quiet <sighs> how can i practice talking and learn my how to formulate a sentence or the definition of the word i can't understand it fully unless i use it in context and you know play around with its meaning and, and its sentence structure? Am I putting it in the right sentence for someone to understand me? How can I do that if I have to be quiet all the time? And then we want them to achieve these amazing written pieces of work. Let's write a story about the grizzly bear that we read about. But in the early years, I'm told to be very quiet all the time. So how can I be a story writer if I can't make up my own stories and talk about them and you know, if said teacher is reading a book and I have an idea, I should be able to share that idea so I can start to make my own stories in my head when I'm four or five, rather than being asked to leave the room because I keep talking. It's, a quarter, it's, very, it's a bad suppression because you're suppressing the person from becoming who they want to be because you're always drilling in authority, authority, authority. When you're drilling that so much, yeah, you dampen them and you dampen their soul, you know, where they, when you want a response from them, when you're looking for a response from them, they can't give it to you. They can't, you know what I mean? Because they're so used to being under certain authorities, you know, that if I step out of line here, I'm going to get into trouble. You know, but you stepping out of line, that's you're coming out of your comfort zone. You will grow. Amazing things will happen when you step out of that line. So I believe that that's why they have it like that, because they don't want kids to step out of that line there. They want everyone to be all aligned in one thing. So, yep, we can all assess you in one, you know. We spend thousands and thousands of pounds from local authority and above to support these behaviours in school and mental health. Just make them believe in themselves from the beginning, then we wouldn't have to do that. We wouldn't have to spend all that time and effort. When actually they're good kids. They're people that just want to please and engage in their world and they're just, they don't know how. Because it's, it's not what they were intrinsically motivated to do from the beginning, so therefore I've told myself I'm not very good at that. It's heartbreaking. What do you think is different about home education and going to school? You play like, and play and play and improve your children. No, when when you're, you're stuff. no, when you're at school, you sit down and most of the time you're on the computer and they send you on the computer and they get you off and you need to read all day long. And also you need to write. Yeah. Uh, when you go outside, and you only stay for one minute at the playground. Do you have any friends that go to school? I have about... I oh. have about... Two. Have Molly and Celine. And what do they say about going to school? What do they say about it? Molly hates school. Celine loves school.
I think at nursery, I started to see a little bit of what school, primary school would be like in terms of the lack of control that you have over your own children and the way in which teachers and the authorities tend to take, undermine your parenting yeah, and want to take control and, and in some respects think that they know your child more than you did. And I saw that at nursery stage. So that's why we decided to look into homeschooling. Because I thought if that was at nursery stage, I couldn't imagine what primary stage would be like. So we've got two boys, um, Isaiah and Zion. They're age seven now. Um, Isaiah is diagnosed with autism. So he has a, a statement of special educational needs. And Zion will be classed as mainstream. We had been looking into home education just in case things didn't go the way that we wanted with the school application. And it just so happened that um, this is where we, where we were at. So we just decided to not take the place that we got offered and start home edding. Isaiah, my special needs child, relies a lot on Zion in terms of his social cues. So um, he wasn't very sociable at all at nursery. He had a few friends uh, that, he, that interacted with him, but I found that since our homeschooling journey began, he's seen Zion interact with children and then taking the cues from him to know how to interact with children. And I find that now he interacts with them as well as um, on his own, but he still tries to do what they do. And he follows Zion in that sense to, to know what to do, what not to do, when to go and things like that. Yeah, well, in school, he'll be expected to um, keep up with the children that are at his level, um, but he would not be able to do that. So he'll have to have a specific curriculum specifically for himself therefore making him not being able to um, access the curriculum how he should be at school. So at home we go at his pace and what he can do and what he can't do, um, what his interests are and we just kind of take it day by day in that sense. Um, if he wants to do something then we'll, we'll do it but I don't force him to do anything that he doesn't, he's not comfortable with doing or he's not happy to do because I want him to be happy to to learn whatever it is that we're learning or to engage in whatever he wants, what I want him to engage in. Because if you're not happy to engage in it, then you're not going to really get the benefit from it. If you look at the law, it's very clear that parents are the people who are responsible for the education. And it says that you have to provide a suitable education at school or otherwise. That's a really important thing because if parents weren't responsible for the education, every school that put God put in special measures, the parents would be able to see the local authority. Nobody knows how many people home educate because you don't have to register. We register when we want a service. So if I want to go to the GP, I have to register. If I want to send them to school, I register. But if I don't want to send them to school, I shouldn't need to register because it's not a service that I want. Um, Bureaucrats find this quite terrifying, but why? Just because you don't register for one service doesn't mean to say that you're suddenly not known, because, you know, all children are registered at birth. Pretty much all of them are registered at the GP. Uh, most of them will be registered with libraries, sports clubs, governments, that kind of thing.
thing. So it's not as though they're not known, it's just, it's made out that this is some huge problem because they don't really like the fact that we're not in school. Once you start home educating, then there's a blurred line between the statement of school and then the statement with home education. In one sense, they say, well, if you're not in school, then you don't get those, um, that you don't get those facilities. But then in the other sense, they're saying, well, if you're home educating, you have to provide those um, facilities that is stated within the statement. So it's kind of like goes back and forth. At the moment, I'm in the situation where um, I'm being told or trying to be persuaded to send him to school so he can get access to what's on the statement. But if I don't send him to school, then I won't get what's on the statement. And if I'm home edding, then I have to provide what's on the statement. So my argument is that if the statement is specifically for school, then it should be either seized or continued at home, for home ed. So I, I shouldn't have to be forced to comply with the statement if I'm home edding, if it's the statement is for school. So it's kind of a, 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 a merry-go-round that I'm in at the moment, where they're arguing one thing, I'm arguing another thing, and it's looking like they might be um, seeking a school attendance order which then that will the court will then have will force me to send my child to school um, so yes it's a very complicated um, situation with the statement in um, and I just don't don't think that it's fair I tried to do a chemistry A level because I wanted to study nutrition and I had anxiety attacks throughout and so and it definitely like it was like the first time I was back in proper study and I just couldn't handle it. I just assumed I would fail. I just assumed constantly that I would fail. I also didn't remember any of the teaching. I mean I, w I got through school more or less. I mean I got kicked out of one school. Oh, and that was quite horrible because I appealed to try and get back in. And in the appeal, you have a few of the governors, you had the head, the deputy head, my tutor, and I think another teacher, and they basically had to, in front of me, put a reason why they couldn't let me in school and they just slaughtered me, you know? Yeah. Slaughtered me. My memory is like, <gasps> Like that you were supposed to be my like you were supposed to be nice like my you were supposed to help me and whew, you know that just didn't happen. Academies and free schools are excluding pupils at a rate some three times more than um, grant maintained schools. Um, now there is a trend that that's come down over the last year from seven times to three times. But what concerns me is that there is, you know, with the acceleration of creating academies and free schools, that we're likely to see that trend continue where academies, for various reasons, for various motivation, want to exclude pupils rather than actually provide support resources for them. And I think that, that's, that's very concerning. And that's not a thing you see, read in the press or anything coming out from the DFE or government about, um, about schools, academies in particular. Basically, um, I had a bit of a disagreement with a the teacher, then it escalated. After that, um, I was suspended. After I got suspended, I come back off my suspension and I got into... I was told if I misbehave again or cause any disturbances or any interruptions to other people's learning or just be of, like, just cause any trouble... I will get excluded. I got into a little row with my friend in the playground. We ended up having a fight after school, but I was not too far away from the school. And uh, the teachers got to find out because obviously the local community and the local people in the area 
went straight to the school because they knew my blazer. And then there was like an ID parade the day after with local people in the community to point out who was fighting and who was causing the disruption in the community. So the, obviously the guy spotted my face because he saw me the day yesterday, but he didn't know who I was. He couldn't give a good description. So they allowed these people to come into the school at lunchtime in the canteen to pick out who's who's who and what's what. So from there, I got excluded from that because they deemed to believe it's given a bad reputation to the school. So they just kicked me out right before my um, GCSEs. I didn't, I managed to appeal first time. I didn't get through. I failed. Second time I appealed again and I got through. Yeah, by God's grace, I was able to just get my GCSEs. Otherwise, I don't reckon I would have got them if I didn't appeal the second time. Yeah, well, if my mum didn't push forward for it, I don't reckon I would have had any GCSEs to my name now. You know, I felt that that was my most important part of my life for me at the time and my school wasn't willing to... Um, work around my issues which most schools have the same problem now they find a child that's got an issue or problem they're like all right cool we'll just suspend you or we'll just exclude you because we can't afford we don't have time to look into the issue so that's what it was yeah you know you, you think there's harm in a school they say between two say two young people uh, say a conflict a fight or whatever it is or conflict between a, a teacher and a, and a whole class or another another pupil. And um, it seems to be our punitive authoritarian type of way of, of uh, managing behavior is to punish, as if punishment has this miraculous, um, like a magic wand that the person will come out of it and suddenly have these realizations of the sense of the occasion, of empathy, respect, what the other people that the person is feeling, how appropriate their behaviour is, how they can manage their behaviour and what's the long term, you know. It's almost like, well, we're going to exclude you for, or for two weeks or permanently or put you in isolation or take these privileges away and magically you'll come out of it. I don't know who the hell <laughs> believe, but it's obviously, it's a system and it's in place and that's how it goes. I feel that senior school teachers need to have a lot more training and input on actual leadership and management skills and self, you know, respecting other people, helping people work through change, move through change, inspiring the mind rather than just here's how you teach a, a physics syllabus, here's how you test it, here's how you have classroom control. home educated all the way up to did my GCSEs at home and there was plava with getting an exam hall and that sort of thing and then a level I went into sixth form at the grammar school that was five minutes walk from my home literally which was nice it was just across the road really um, and I looked around and I thought it would be much different from home education but I found that the way they teach in a level the way they teach, taught in that school, uh, for the sixth form, it's pretty much like what I did in, her, in home education, just with a teacher. But then, what they do in the lower things, it's not like that. It's, it's rigid, it's structured. They have to go around in these humongous groups. They have to, they have to do things over and over again. It's drudgery. It's mindless. I don't like it. I don't think I would have done very well in school before GCSEs. But I think that it's perfectly fine afterwards because they're working with smaller groups. I think they should do all of school like that and lots of people would learn a lot better. I think that would be perfectly fine to teach smaller children how they teach the 16 year olds because they teach them like actual people. You know, they learn at their own time and if they have a schedule that means your kid is going to be classified as falling behind because he hadn't, hasn't hit X marker by this age, 
I think that's a really damaging lesson to learn very early on. And I don't know if you recover from that lesson. Even if you do, you know, make the shift one day to the next. Just this sort of gradient of scholastic or academic knowledge. But as far as the whole child, there's less of a grading around that. Um, to the detriment of things like my mental health or well-being or my ability to actually understand the world around me as it, sta as it is now so that I can have a starting point to then move on. Oh, you're in year five? Or we're going to grade you against what you need to know in maths, English and science in year five. Oh, what a shame. You're not quite there. Okay, let's put an intervention to try and teach you stuff you need to know in order to work in this curriculum. You know, it, life is so much broader than that and we should be preparing our children for life rather than for a test. The first question isn't it like how they're going to be socialized well first of all I quite like that home education means they mix all the time with a range of ages so they have people in their day-to-day -day lives and in their daily lives that range right from adulthood to um, to really young babies and they you see the real benefits always of a child of a similar age and you know home educating parents often make an effort to connect with families who've got children of similar ages because of that but also there's a real benefit to like having to negotiate your way through people who are more or less competent and um, because of their age um, so in that sense I, I, I feel like their day-to-day -day experience is more like I'm gonna say natural but obviously like it's not about nature versus synthetic things but I do think if you were going to slap synthetic onto a social context being in the room with 30 people who were born within six months of you is quite synthetic really it's not going to happen in any other time apart from when you're at school I really like that they're really confident with adults and they're not socialised into a thing where they must obey the person who is in authority with them, that they know how to draw a line with someone um, because they they are used to a lot of adults and they're not in that situation where actually they have to be taught to obey the people who are in charge of them because I think that's quite a dangerous thing to teach children. My experience of older home educated children is that they're very good at talking to adults um, and there's not a sort of layer of distrust between my agenda for telling them something that I experience even at university when I'm at, uh, in my role as a university teacher. Um, a significant number of students come at 18 having been through the school system and not paused for breath, feeling like automatically because of my teacher role in relation to them I am not fully trustworthy and I am not f you know that I have an agenda for telling them things and I'm trying to manipulate them into a standard of behavior that they are not interested in so I, I quite like the social thing in home education it's the most it's like the thing that home education does the best is socializing children in into non-confrontational relationships with adults um, and also it gives them a bit of space to not have to deal with someone over and over again which th when they're you know at six seven eight nine ten 
11, 12, you know, you're not fully emotionally mature. Like, how are you expected to handle a really difficult peer? Because I think of adults who are in difficult relationships in their working life, and it, you know, it causes massive misery. And those are people who's, who are fully developed. In the United States, there's consensus right now that schools for the poor, schools for immigrant kids, schools for um, uh, the descendants of formerly enslaved people are failing to educate those kids. There's no consensus that we should fix them. And that's where, the, where, where we break down. And, and the reasons are you know, multiple and complex, but in a word, the reasons are the traditional um, markers of privilege and oppression are played out in the schools. And so we live in the, with the afterlife of slavery with us at all times. And when I was first involved in schooling and social movements, I was involved in the civil rights movement and the, and the fight for integration of the schools, the fight to, uh, for full equality in voting and education for African Americans. And we won partial victories in that, but very partial. And the form that white supremacy takes today is um, uh, the creation of slums, of ghettos, which are driven by a government policy um, and which exist all over our country, but in the big cities in particular. Mass incarceration, which is devastating uh, to the black community, devastating. We have, you undoubtedly know, we have two and a half million of our fellow citizens in prison, overrepresented by black and and brown people, overwhelmingly poor people. And for every person incarcerated, there's a family, a mother, a father, uh, children, um, wives, girlfriends, fiancés, who are suffering along with them. So we have millions of people caught up. In fact, the numbers are staggering. We, uh, we are 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prison population. We have more African-American men under carceral supervision today than we had slaves in 1850. So the numbers are staggering, and that's why the schools are failing. The, to say the schools are failing is a misstatement. All schools aren't failing. The schools that my kids went to aren't failing. The schools that the Obama kids went to aren't failing. The schools of the privileged are not failing. But here's the rub. In a democracy, whatever the most privileged and wisest parents have for their children should be the standard that we as a community want for all children. Without realizing that, democracy is undermined and ultimately destroyed. That's the, 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 the dilemma we're facing. That's the crisis that we're facing today. It feels like we're worse now than we were 30, 40 years ago. And yet we're doing everything within our power to close the gap. I mean, that's all head teachers ever hear at any conference you go to. What are you doing to close your 20% gap of disadvantage to not? And what the challenge is, is we're just teaching to these tests. So actually, the more we teach, and good teaching, but you're doing that then. So your gap is never closing. But the reason why is because these kids can't move forward is because you're just teaching them only what they have to know to sit that test. You're not actually making learning connections to where my starting points are and to my emotional interests. You know, if my nervous system is worried, then I'm only just going to do what I have to do and get out of there as fast as possible. And, and my brain actually isn't going to really learn that and engage in it. It's just going to, like we said, sit in that working memory for a minute and then it goes. So therefore, when they get to the next year, oh, they're still just, you know, just here. <laughs> Whereas actually they would fly. But we have to, if we can 
make all the links first, and that ha has to happen through play. It is terribly difficult to explain to people that basically we should just change the approach in early years, give all children a bit longer to have a bit of the childhood, start the formal education later when they're readier, and then far more of them are likely to thrive. Some people learn differently. Some of the people that were learning, they can't, they were learning, they wanted to do physical activities. You know what I'm saying? They didn't want to do mental engaging activities. There's a difference of that, you know? Like one of my friends, Hadley, he's a rugby player, but he got excluded, but now he's a professional rugby player because he always wanted to play rugby. You know, he was built for it. His mindset was like that. So he's a rugby player, so the school couldn't cater for that. So they kicked him out, but he, it didn't stop him from being a successful rugby player which he is now today so yeah in a way it slims your chances because it slims your chances in a way where it will affect you where you think that you're not you're not going to be accepted anywhere else now because the school has kicked you out now so oh, nobody's going to respect you because you've got no grades or no one's going to take you for the person you are because you've got no grades but it's not just that you know it, 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 there's a bigger picture to the all of that there's a bigger picture to all of that, really. And I've realised that myself. Do what you love to do. What you love to do, you do. What's inside, what, what... Make your passion become a job. You know what I'm saying? Make what he's passionate about become a job. Don't believe that a plan is always your plan. You know, make your own plan and go with your plan. So there's a moment we require schools to do many, many jobs, but we only really talk about their educational purpose and we talk about their other jobs when they fail them or when a child has been failed by the wider society. So when a child has come to the attention of the, the national press because you know something terrible has happened to them, that's the moment where suddenly the schools are like the point of all safeguarding or they've become really responsible in that, in that, safe, in, in that, in that sort of context. But if we could just really clarify for ourselves that children, they require education, that's true. Um, they require safeguarding, that's also true. And then there's like emotional and spiritual or, um, you know, just holistic well-being. And we're expecting schools to achieve all of those things with children in a really strange institutional setting for all of those aims. Um, and if we could really work through taking some of that burden off schools or s placing clarity around those different roles, it would actually be easier to ensure or to feel like home educators were not a massive threat, I think. if we. If, for example, health visitors were actually in charge of safeguarding children right up until they were 16, then, you know, my children's contact with a health visitor would be seen as a safeguarding mechanism. But at the moment, my children are regarded as potentially in danger from me because they don't go to school. <laughs> Follow it.
My mum obviously had my brother at 12 and then my sister at, when I was about 15 or 14. So by the time I was coming close to the end of school, he was around the age he would have been going in. And I think because of the experience that I had, she was desperately trying to look for another alternative and found homeschooling. So my siblings were homeschooled until my sister was 11 or 10 and decided to go to school off her own back. So then I watched what children go through when they're homeschooled and it just can't even compare it. Can't even like, it's not, it's just, Seems like a tad abusive now, sending your children to school in this society, you know? Initially, I'd say the big difference is the attachment. They have a knowing that, that they have their, their security. Because they were four, four years old is young to be taken away from your parents for such a long time or from a, a loved one, anyone. Um, I don't have that. I think I, I have real abandonment stuff because I was ripped away. I actually went to nursery as well. Um, and I must have missed her. I must have missed her. Even if it wasn't her, like someone that loved me. Because there was lots of people who didn't love me, looking after me, you know. And lots of people probably stressed. No one can really love you and look after you the way someone, you know, cares for you can. Do you want to get down? What else is the difference? They were never told, they were never put in sets. I don't think they ever thought they couldn't do something. Sometimes they didn't want to do things. If they wanted to do it, that always amazed me that they approached it with like a, an attitude of, I'm just gonna do it. Never seemed to even come into their head, you might not be able to do it. Which is the first thing I'd think. Like, oh, I wanna learn the guitar. I won't be able to do that. I might not be able to do it. Oh, I don't know if I should waste my time. Or oh, it will take a long time. They also could apply themselves differently because I think they'd never been forced. There'd never been time constraints or like pressure put on anything. So it was just like, yeah, all right, I'll sit here and read this book or play my Lego for four hours solid, you know? And that was one of the things that came, you know, my ADHD was attention deficit hyperactive disorder. One of the things was my attention was supposed to be really short. My attention was short because looking back, I was forced to learn English and maths in a really like boring way, you know? Really boring. Staring at a wall or, you know, a, a board, sitting on the same seat, not able to talk or you know, converse about anything to my mates and it's really boring, boring atmosphere, you know.
many things are different. Still to this day, one's 17, one's 15, I'm 29, and they, I feel that they are, they are more able. They are, they are, they can do anything. They can just, they both are quite good with languages. They're very good with music. My memory's not very good. Well, I feel my memory's not very, very good. Um, I think they're also aware of, because they had a lot of time going to thousands of different trips, whereas I went on three trips a year, maximum, you know. They went on all these hundreds of trips, so they got to see a real rounded view of what you can do in life. It's not just you can be a teacher or you can be maybe a doctor or you can be working a shop. Let's be honest, I wasn't never going to be a GP. I'm definitely not going to be a teacher now. So, you know, there wasn't much. Whereas they have this whole plethora of like ideas of what people can do and be. And I think that makes it more exciting learning something. And I mean, you know, a homeschooling parent doesn't always get it right, but what they have is they don't have the pressure. They have the time to think and to see and to watch their children. And, you know. Do you think you'll ever go to school? I don't want to. Never ever. I'll only go to school when I'm 12. Okay. I'm only going to school when I'm... I want to go to school when I'm... Okay. <laughs> 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 this is so the right to play is enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. It is Article 31. As developmental psychologists are telling us more and more, neuroscience is proving it, that play is as important to children's development as things like food and sleep. So if they're not playing, and increasingly our children are, are taking on sort of entertainment or sort of organised activities rather than play, um, if they're not playing, they are missing out on an essential human right. If this world were mine, I'd have children in government. I'd have children for president. Make it all the rules, we could start again. If this world were mine, I'd use music for therapy To soothe the good, the bad and the ugly Stop all this craziness around me If this world of mine There'd be no borders And I'd travel where I wanna And only love would be the order If this world of mine Just like a bird I'd fly this world of mine If this world of mine If this world of mine There'd be no tearful goodbyes No sadness when we die But dancing song Cause life lives on If this world of mine be one big family Impossible maybe But we can try, can't we? If this world of mine Love would be the king And justice the queen yeah. To reign forever, I mean If this world of mine There'd be an answer If this world